Before the landmark case of Brown versus the Board of Education and before Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, in Detroit, Michigan, in 1945, Sarah Elizabeth Haskell filed a civil rights lawsuit against the Bob Lowe Excursion Company, which brought them before the United States Supreme Court. Did you talk about that a little bit? What makes you do Well, you see, I was always uh, free soul. I was free. I want to go to school like everybody else. I want to be a lawyer, a doctor, or something. I wanted to be a school teacher because that's what I saw. But there all these obstacles were out there for me. And, and it was, I, I, if I was a man, I probably would have gotten strung up to a tree. Uh, in Wauhatchie, that's about 25 miles outside of Chattanooga. It was a struggle trying to get to school. My mother would go and raise sand with the authorities. The beautiful countryside, and I love that part of it. Where we live, there were only two black families, and we lived about 10 miles from each other. Therefore, you only had a half a dozen black children at one time. It was an imposition to provide transportation. They, they, the white kids had a bus, <laughs> but we never had a bus. When they did provide transportation, they made arrangements for us to ride in with a farmer, and we rode in that milk truck. And I didn't like the laws that they had, all the restrictions on white and black. I didn't, I didn't like that, that bothered me. In the bus station, there's a sign, black and white. And in restaurants, same thing. And all, and the, in the black area, sometimes you have to go all the way around the building to get to it. And it was small and junky and filthy, and that was the case of everything public. My mother was glad to get me away from there because I was free. I heard people saying, yes, um, no, um, yes, um. no, no, no. I said, yes. My mother said, uh-uh. <coughs> yes, Mrs. Brown. <laughs> That's the best I can do, uh-uh. I couldn't say yes, um, yes, um. Uh-uh, that's degrading. I learned to read early, and I read the newspapers and magazines, and it was my understanding that up north, after you pass the Mason-Dixon line and Cincinnati, that you'd be free. That's why I came to Michigan. And that's why I was so astonished when I found it to be that wasn't true. What happened to me at Bablo? I was taking a secretarial course. That was a great big break for me. When we graduated, the girls recommended that we celebrate. One girl collected all the money and and uh, she went down and bought all the tickets. We were lined up getting on the boat and when the ticket taker was taking tickets and taking tickets and when he took the ticket from my hand, he saw the color and he looked up and then he didn't say anything. He took the ticket and we all got on the boat and the boat was delayed. Two men, they were dressed in white coats, came and they headed directly for me. And they came up and said, you will have to leave the boat. And I asked why. They said, they told me that they didn't allow 
I think they called us Negroes in those days, on the boat. And the teacher was sitting beside me and she said, she'll go quietly. That really <laughs> added insult to injury. <laughs> white teacher, everybody was white but me. And I did, I got up and left with them. What courses, I mean two men. I wasn't going to fight anyway. So I got off the boat, they gave me back the money and I looked at the boat and I, I was so angry, angry and hurt and humiliated, embarrassed before all these girls. To think that I'd spent months with these girls and all of a sudden I'm different. I was I'd so upset I didn't know what to do. I threw the money back at the boat. I don't know what satisfaction that got me. And the next move I made was to find a telephone and call the NACP. And that started the whole thing toward the court. The lawyer had me come with him, but I, was, I never said anything. And it's a good thing because I was so angry. I was so angry that uh, I, I would not have been able to contain myself. I'd have said a lot of things that shouldn't be said. <laughs> but that's not how you win a case. They lost at every level. They kept appealing every time they'd lose. And they lost at every level all the way to, the, then they appealed to the Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court. And they lost there. There's nowhere else to go. What kept me here was Action House. That developed out of the riot. I held some meetings and called in John Conyers, you know, Congressman Conyers, and various people like that to speak to the community, asked me if we could do something on an ongoing basis. I said, oh, you mean a community center? We had lots of programs over there. The first two years, we were federally funded. And after the first two years, I had a few people like Dorothy Kresge, the dime store lady, couple of people in Gross Point that I would be able to get enough money from them to pay a staff. And we had lots of trips we took and I could take the kids on trips because I found out that ghetto kids had never even been to Belle Isle. So I took them not only to Belle Isle but uh, Greenfield Village all the parks around the state to let them see how other people lived. One time in Gross Point, one of the boys said, how come we can't have a houses like these? I said, you can if you stay in school. <laughs> yeah, I have a nephew that hates white people. Now what Oprah say about that, while he's sitting here hating white people, they're going shopping. <laughs> Just can't, can't, can't stay angry forever. <laughs> Liz Haskell never did ride the Bablo boat, but many thousands did. Bablo Island continued to be a popular amusement park until the ferry stopped running in 1991. Currently, the island is a private residential community of luxury homes and condominiums. After Action House served the community for 25 years, Liz was unable to find a buyer for the building. Mrs. Haskell subsisted on Social Security until she passed away in 2006. Gentlemen.